You know, when you think of the Appalachian frontier, one name stands out. That's Daniel Boone. Now, Boone was involved in pretty much every stage of exploration and settlement in southern Appalachia during the late 18th century. And over the next few episodes, Rod and I are going to tell you the story of Daniel Boone. You're listening to Stories, A History of Appalachia. Steve, we really have to tell people that when we talk about Daniel Boone, this is not the Daniel Boone from the late 60s in the television series with Fess Parker, because it doesn't even come close to telling the story about Daniel Boone. That's all fabricated Hollywood. When we get down to talking about Daniel Boone, there's a lot of stuff to talk about to this man. Daniel Boone is Appalachia, and there is so much to his story We couldn't possibly get it into one podcast. That's why we're going to do it over the next three podcasts. And so I guess the first part, we're going to talk about Daniel's beginnings up in Pennsylvania. Well, Daniel Boone was born on November 2nd, 1734 in the Ole Valley in Berks County, Pennsylvania, near present day reading. Boone was a first generation American. His father, Squire, having been born in Devon, England, near Exeter, Daniel's mother, Sarah, was born in Wales. Now, the elder Boones were members of the Religious Society of Friends, or as we also call them, Rod, the Quakers. Mm -hmm. And they had immigrated to the American Quaker colony of Pennsylvania early in the 1700s. Well, the Quakers had settled in Lenape Indian Territory, and the children of the Englishmen and women learned much from their Indian neighbors about the forests that surrounded them. Daniel Boone was no exception. At the age of 12, Daniel was given his first rifle and learned from the Lenape and from older men how to hunt and how to navigate through the unending forest. Now, Boone was a good student, and soon stories began being told about his hunting prowess. One story goes that young Daniel was hunting in the woods one day with some other boys when the howl of a panther caused the boys to run, all of them except for Boone. Daniel calmly cocked his rifle, took aim, and shot the cat through the heart just as it leaped at him. The Boone family's time in the Pennsylvania Quaker settlement was marked with controversy caused by, of all things, young love. You see, Daniel's oldest sister, also named Sarah like his mom, had met and fallen in love with John Wilcoxon, whom she married in 1742. Now, that would have been the time for joy in the community, you'd think, but for the fact that Wilcoxon was not a Quaker, but what the religious sect termed a, quote, worldling. Squire and the elder Sarah had to publicly apologize to the community for their daughter's grave sin of marrying outside of her faith, and so it appeared to be settled until five years later. In 1727, Israel Boone also met someone with whom he fell in love and married, And she, like John Wilcoxon, was a worldling, and the church was not happy. Squire Boone refused to apologize this time, standing by his oldest son's decision to marry outside the Quaker faith. As a result, Squire Boone was expelled from the Religious Society of Friends. Three years of excommunication was enough for the elder Boone, and in 1750, he packed up his family and headed south to the Yadkin River Valley Settlement in North Carolina. At the time, Daniel was 16, and he never attended church again, although he continued to identify as a Christian and made sure that his children were all baptized. Not only did Boone not attend church, he rarely attended school, although he did learn to read and to write, although his spelling left a lot to be desired. A school teacher there at the Yadkin settlement took Squire Boone aside to express her concern over Daniel's education, but Squire replied, quote, let the girls do the spelling, and Dan will do the shooting, end quote. Now, just because Daniel Boone didn't like formal schooling didn't mean that he was completely uneducated. He often took reading material along with him on his legendary long hunts, including his two favorite books, The Bible and Gulliver's Travels. In fact, there are stories of Boone entertaining his hunting companions by reading from these books to them at night around the campfire. Well, in 1754, world events intervened in Boone's life on the frontier when North Carolina sent out a call for volunteers to join the state militia for service in the French and Indian War. Boone joined the militia under Captain Hugh Waddell. Now, this unit was assigned to General Edward Braddock for service on the Ohio River frontier around present-day Pittsburgh. 
and Boone was assigned as a wagoner in charge of the supply wagons that kept the troops marching, and off they went. In the Battle of the Monongahela River, Daniel Boone was almost killed when his wagon was attacked by Indians. While in the Ohio country, Boone met John Finley, a fur packer in the Trans-Appalachian fur trade, who regaled the young man with tales of the abundant game in Appalachia, which piqued Boone's interest in the Kentucky country. Well, after Boone's term of service was up, he returned to North Carolina and he married a neighbor girl, Rebecca Bryan, on August 14, 1756, in the Yadkin Valley. The couple eventually produced 10 children, one of whom, Nathan, became the first European born in Kentucky. In order to support his growing family, Daniel Boone worked as a trapper and hunter. Every fall, he would go off on his long hunts for weeks or months at a time, gathering furs to sell and meat to eat. In order to find his game, Boone and his men used ancient bison migration routes. That's right, bison. They roamed the Appalachians as well as the Great Plains at that time, and these routes were called the medicine trails by local Indians. As they traveled, Boone would carve his name on trees to commemorate what he considered notable events, and he obviously thought that killing a bear was one of these events, as evidenced by two carvings that he made. Along Boone's Creek in Washington County, Tennessee, yes, named after him, and by the way, Rod, when I was in college, I lived in a trailer probably about a quarter of a mile from where this tree once stood. Anyway, wow. at that place, Daniel Boone carved D. Boone Kilt to Bar, 1760, on a tree which was standing as late as the 20th century. Another carving is preserved at the Filson Historical Museum in Louisville, Kentucky, which reads, D. Boone Kilt to Bar, 1803. The bears never stood a chance. Well, this life came to an end in 1758 when war erupted between the British and the Cherokee. Cherokee Indians raided the Yadkin Valley settlements, and the Boone family, along with others, had to flee to Culpeper County, Virginia, in safety. Boone rejoined the North Carolina militia, which pursued and fought the Cherokee across the Appalachian Mountains of the state. Peace was reestablished in the mid-1760s, and Boone's family and the other settlers returned to the Yadkin. Soon, new settlers were flooding into the River Valley, causing problems for Daniel Boone. Because with the new settlers, the amount of available game decreased, and soon Boone had trouble making ends meet. Less game meant fewer furs to sell and less meat for the family. And falling deep into debt, Boone was taken to court by his creditors. In order to get out from under his debts, Daniel Boone ended up selling his land to pay them off. This became a recurring pattern for him, as we'll tell you about later. In 1765, the patriarch of the Boone family, Squire, died. Daniel got the idea that maybe it'd be better to find a new place for his family, you know, away from the Yadkin, and to get a fresh start. And Boone thought that fresh start would be in the brand new British territory of Florida. Well, Boone and his brother, also named Squire, left for the future Sunshine State shortly after the elder Squire Boone died in order to explore and to look for land on which to settle. And Daniel found what he was looking for and bought a tract of land near what's now Pensacola. But upon returning to North Carolina, Rebecca refused to move there, so far away from her family and friends. So Boone gave up on his idea of life in Florida and returned home to live a little bit farther up to Yadkin, away from the rest of the folks living there. He then began to look west to that game-rich land that John Finley told him about 12 years before. Kentucky was now his dream. By now, there was a treaty with the Iroquois Indians, one of the major tribes who claimed the area of present-day Kentucky and West Virginia. This treaty, the Treaty of Fort Stanwix, had ceded Iroquois claims to the area to the British. This, along with Finley's stories, interested Boone enough to cause him to convince his brother Squire to join him on an expedition to the area. Boone and his men entered Kentucky for the first time in 1767 near present-day Elkhorn City. On May 11, 1769, Boone returned on another long hunt to Kentucky, which was, by the way, part of that legendary super county of Fincastle, Virginia, which now no longer exists. On December 22nd, he and a fellow hunter, Benjamin Cutberth, were captured by a party of Shawnees. 
They took all of their furs and told them to leave and to never return. You see, the Shawnees were not a party to the Fort Stanwix Treaty, and they considered white hunters to be poachers on their lands. Regardless, Boone didn't leave until 1771, spending that time replenishing the furs that the Shawnee had taken from him. Now, with two trips under his belt, Boone decided that it was time to bring settlers to the Kentucky region. On September 25, 1773, Boone's party began the first attempt to settle in Kentucky, heading north to Wolf Hills at Abingdon, Virginia. Here, Boone sent his 17-year-old son James on to Castle's Woods, or Castlewood as we call it now, to pick up another member of the expedition, Captain William Russell and his party of settlers who'd be joining Boone's party. Boone then headed west toward present-day Kingsport, from where he headed north along what's now U.S. 23 toward Duffield, Virginia. From there, he crossed into Powell Valley and camped on the northern side of Wallens Ridge to wait for the Russell party to catch up with them. James Boone, meanwhile, had reached the Russell party, finding that they were nowhere near ready to set out. Well, in order to let Boone know this, Captain Russell sent James Boone and his son Henry along with Isaac Crabtree and two slaves, Adam and Charles, and a few of the settlers. They tried to follow the trail that would lead to the main Boone expedition, but they lost that trail and ended up on the night of October 8th somewhere on Wallens Creek, likely near what's now Stickleyville in Scott County, Virginia. After a night spent listening to wolves howling in the wilderness, the party was awakened to a raid from a party of Shawnee and Cherokee. James Boone and Henry Russell were shot through the hips so they couldn't escape. They were then tortured with knives. James recognized his torturer as Big Jim, a Shawnee who had been a guest at the Boone home back in North Carolina. He begged the man to kill him and put him out of his misery. Isaac Crabtree managed to escape and return east to the settlements along the clinch. Henry Russell was clubbed to death and shot full of arrows. Two brothers, the Mendenhall, and a man named Whiteside Hargis were also killed. The Indians took the rest of the party captive, including Whiteside's nephew, also named Whiteside, and went back to Kentucky. Young Whiteside was adopted by the Shawnee and later joined Chief Benji in his raids against the settlers in southwest Virginia. Upon word reaching Boone of this attack, he immediately called off the expedition and returned to the Atkins. Well, this massacre was one of the first events in Lord Dunmore's War, a fight between Virginia and the Shawnee of the Ohio River Valley for control of present-day West Virginia and Kentucky. The next year, in 1774, Boone and a companion traveled to Kentucky to notify surveyors in the area about the beginning of the war, traveling more than 800 miles in two months to do so. Boone then returned to Virginia and helped defend settlers along the Clinch River, For this, he was made a captain in the Virginia militia. Well, after Virginia's victory in the Battle of Point Pleasant ended Lord Dunmore's war in October 1774, Judge Richard Henderson of North Carolina hired Boone to travel to the Cherokee towns in North Carolina and Tennessee to let them know about an upcoming meeting at the Long Island of the Holston in present-day Kingsport. At that meeting in 1775, Henderson negotiated a treaty purchasing the Cherokee claim to Kentucky to establish a colony there to be called Transylvania. Henderson then hired Boone and Benjamin Cutberth to blaze a road to the new colony, which we now know as the Wilderness Road. Well, Boone and Cutberth laid out the road all the way to the Kentucky River, generally following along Route 23 north out of Kingsport and then down Route 58 to Cumberland Gap. There at the Kentucky River, Boone founded a new settlement that he named Boonesboro. He and Cutberth had also established other settlements at the time, most notably Harrodsburg. Boone returned to the Clinch River and finally brought his family and others to Boonesboro on September 8, 1775. Now, Boone lived happily ever after, right? Well, no. There's a lot more to Daniel Boone's story, which we'll continue to tell in the next episode of Stories. Now, that's just the first part of our podcast, Rod. I mean, we have gotten into some really interesting stories, and there's a whole lot more to come. Yeah, there's a whole lot more. It's a a lot more about some of the area around southwest Virginia and eastern Kentucky, uh, back into North Carolina. The stories just go on and on about this man, and I'm telling you, it's, it's nowhere near exactly at all 
like what Fess Parker used to do on the old TV series. This is much more exciting, I think, in, in my the way I feel about it. Well, it is more exciting. And, you know, it's really kind of strange living in East Tennessee, Southwest Virginia. You think of Daniel Boone like everybody else does. He's this bigger than life legend, you know, like Paul Bunyan or, you know, George Washington. But the man lived here. He was part mm -hmm. of this area. He could have known my ancestors and your ancestors and been buddies with them, to be quite honest with you. Well, that's true. He could have because, I mean, there were a lot of people that moved in and settled into the Russell County area. A lot of people that moved on into the Kentucky uh, region, especially along Elkhorn City and around eastern Kentucky there along the border. So it's it's quite possible. He probably knew some of our um, some of our ancestors out of this whole thing. Yeah, and speaking of Russell County, you know, William Russell, Captain William Russell, we talked about it a minute ago. Mm -hmm. That is who Russell County is named for. That's right. And Russell County, Kentucky is also named for him. So, yeah, there's all kinds of famous people that pop up in East Tennessee and Southwest Virginia from back in pioneer days. And Steve, one other thing that will remind people toward the end of our podcast on Daniel Boone, you know, they're getting ready to finish up a big Daniel Boone uh, History Center, mm -hmm. I think, in Duffield. They're, uh, they've built it. They're getting ready to make it all, I guess, uh, open it up for the public here soon. But it's there on the Wilderness Road, and there's been a lot of planning going into this, too. And so there'll be more stories, I'm sure, that you'll be able to see once you go in there to see that Daniel Boone display. Absolutely. And Daniel Boone's story, by the way, is one of the many stories that make up the history of this place we call home, Appalachia. Thanks for listening. You can subscribe to stories at Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, or on your favorite podcast app. We're on Facebook at Stories of Appalachia and on Twitter at Story Appalachia. Till next time, take care. So long, everybody. Mm -hmm.